Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. And welcome to Invest Africa. I'm Nozi Pombanjwa. Now, intellectual property rights play a critical role in attracting foreign investment into Africa and other markets. And of course, this is to ensure that businesses have adequate protection in the markets that they operate in. Yet, the continent's enforcement laws and archaic registration systems are often seen as simply ineffective. Before we begin our studio discussion, CNBC Africa's Thomas Murray spoke to Fernando Dos Santos, the Director General of the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, and this to discuss what the institution is doing to advance and protect IP across the continent. Let's take a look. RIPO uh, is the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, an intergovernmental organization that was uh, founded in 1976. Uh, the objective was to pull together resources of the uh, different member states uh, for the development of the IP system. We're talking about strategies, policies, laws uh, that uh, governs intellectual property. And uh, when the, the whole system started, the issue is that we understood that Africa was not uh, taking advantage of the intellectual property system. Some intellectual property offices had been formed after independence, but they were not uh, doing uh, much in terms of Africa benefiting from, from, from intellectual property. So uh, this organization was created uh, to register intellectual property um, uh, 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 of uh, rights uh, on behalf of the member states, although we still keep the national office also working. We now have 19 member states as, uh, or in this organization. Let's talk about how Africa compares to the rest of the world in terms of intellectual property law and protecting that IP. If we look to uh, uh, the legal framework, if we look to the institutional framework, you'll realize that after the TRIPS agreement in 1994, uh, the African countries, they uh, really established the systems. So you have laws of intellectual property, good laws, modern laws. Uh, you have offices uh, that deals with intellectual property. You have even a special courts in some of the countries uh, 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 dealing with, uh, with, the, with intellectual property. But where we are failing is that indeed uh, we still have low, low number of applications. If you look at the statistics, and I'm talking about the, the latest statistic from the global IP indicators uh, produced by, by WIPO, uh, 2013 it shows that uh, the world uh, received, the, uh, the IP offices in the world received something like 2,500,000 applications of patents. Uh, the share of Africa on that is 0.6%, meaning 14,900 applications only. And half of uh, those applications were filed in the South African IP office. This leaves only 7,500 applications in the rest of, of Africa. And oh, if we look to trademarks, which is one of the things that we think in Africa the IP office are busy doing, uh, you will see that in the world in 2013, we uh, the IP office received something like 4 million. 500 uh, uh, applications. What is the share of that in Africa? Only 125,000. This is what re uh, Brazil alone receives uh, each year. These are not good numbers because... Let's, let's, let's dive in there. So you say less than 1% of global IP applications coming from Africa. And there's a lot of innovation that we see in the continent. But there's still a very strong dependence on resources, but we need to shift towards a knowledge-based economy. What do these numbers signify? Yeah. It is worse than what you're saying because in what I've said, when I say 0.6% of the applications were filed in Africa, it doesn't mean African applications. Uh, those are the uh, applications that um, the majority of them even comes from outside there. So this does not reflect what is happening in the continent because we know that Africa is really going up in terms of innovation and creativity. This country is rich even in terms of knowledge. But what is not happening in this continent is to turn uh, our rich resources, natural resources, but also our creativity and innovation in, into IP assets. So this is where we're missing the point. And this is where we need to concentrate our efforts so that we can turn 
our uh, uh, natural resources and our, our, our creativity and innovation into the IP assets so that we can be able to drive our economies from uh, natural based, uh, natural resource based economy to knowledge based economy. So this is the point that we, we need it really uh, in our continent to all together work together. Policy makers, uh, IP agents, uh, private sector, corporations, academia, all of us we need to look at this. How do we turn our, our, our wealthy uh, in, 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 in all areas into IP assets? So let's dive in on the work that Aripo is doing in terms of facilitating the IP transactions and for African businesses, entrepreneurs and corporates to secure their IP here. It must be very expensive. What work is being done to streamline this process, make it more accessible to the general population? Oh yes, uh, indeed uh, one of the, uh, the, the things that really happens and maybe I should emphasize that uh, the reason why Africa is still not doing much uh, in terms of IP is uh, awareness, lack of awareness. So we have been doing a lot in terms of, uh, uh, in the last two years, Aripo has been engaged in what we have called the roving seminars. So went through and spent a week in, in each and every uh, uh, member states of, of the organization in roving seminars. So uh, making aware people, entrepreneurs, academia, policy makers about uh, uh, IP. And we are seeing a, num a number of changes happening there. But in in terms of the management of those assets also, we are doing a lot in terms of uh, uh, helping create, becoming a kind of a, a hub and putting together the, the IP office to deal with the IP administration better than the, what they were doing before. Uh, we're coming out with uh, uh, databases in order to connect and understand what is going on, uh, but also we are moving to facilitating the registration itself. For example, we have just introduced in, um, in April this year uh, the online system e-filing so this means that you don't need to move to our headquarters to register your your trademark or patents whatever uh, uh, by just a click it you will be able to register apply and even pay make make a, an e-payment so this is the way we we have to move i believe Joining us now to discuss the opportunities and the challenges in the intellectual property space, I'm joined by Johnny Fiendero, he's a partner at Adams and & Adams, and uh, McLean Sibanda, the chief executive of the Innovation Hub, and he joins us via Skype from Beijing. Gentlemen, thank you for making the time to join us. Johnny, let's, I mean, we've heard from Fernando, but let's maybe bring back the definitional understanding of what intellectual property actually constitutes. Okay, intellectual property is quite a nice broad word and it covers a number of different things. Generally, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, some innovation that, uh, that it covers. And that can, in itself can take a number of forms. So either it would be a trademark or a brand that one has developed or a, te or a technological process or invention, for example. Uh, it extends to all sorts of copyright works, um, new, uh, newly designed products that look nice. So it's a very broad word, and, and, and that's on the one side. And on the other side, there's a number of, of what you also call unregisterable rights. Again, all more, on, all more on the copyright side. So it, it's a very broad word that ultimately mm. aims to cover any product of the mind. McLean, does this not, in its essence, because of it, because of it being broad, the concept introduces a certain number of problematic issues. Is there a common understanding of what IP constitutes, especially if we start looking at developed markets versus developing markets? Do we adhere to the same understanding? Mm. Yeah, thanks, Nozipa. I think, uh, you know, the, as uh, you know, Johnny has said, I mean, intellectual property describes the creations of the mind. And indeed, there's been a difference in terms of approach between developing countries and developed countries. Amongst the developed uh, countries, they've seen intellectual property as being uh, almost a currency uh, for the knowledge economy. And within the developing uh, countries, South Africa included, we've tended to lag behind in terms of capitalizing on our own creations. Much of it has also been you know, a, an issue of education, an issue of awareness. Uh, and as Johnny spoke about, I mean, copyright happens, occurs in everyday life. Uh, musicians create uh, copyrighted works, artists create copyrighted works, but in terms of actually monetizing that uh, within the developing world, we've not been able to do so. But also when one looks uh, in terms of technological uh, you know, areas, patents, that is an area that we lag behind in the developing world 
And that is an area that we need to be actually capitalizing on in, say, in, in promoting inventions and the protection mm -hmm. of those inventions. <laughs> Johnny, so McLean has uh, outlined a number of uh, disconnects and gaps that exist, especially in developing markets. Do you get a sense that there's an appreciation for these gaps and that there's a steady commitment to investing in bridging these gaps? I think there's, to a sense, yes. I mean, but there certainly are gaps. And, you know, part of my job, certainly as an IP professional in South Africa, is to try and address those gaps. Mm. Um, and it's, as McLean was mentioning, it's, it really is about education and appreciation because in many aspects we do lag behind uh, developed countries quite significantly. And, and you know, I'm, I'm on the patent side, so I can certainly see it from that point of view. And... Um, and there's a d different sense of, of appreciation. Some mm. people do respect it and uh, others simply don't. But I, I want us to tap into that legal um, uh, expertise as well. Do you get the sense that the legal framework, whether it be in South Africa or the broader continent, is keeping up the pace with uh, the move towards innovation-driven economies and then the need to obviously protect whatever IP the country and its people are generating legally, practically, is the legal profession keeping up the pace? I mean, in terms of uh, legal statutes, uh, again, yes and no. I think different countries would have uh, different provisions. In South Africa, the, the, the IP environment from a legal framework point of view is not bad at all. Um, there are obviously some changes that need, need to be made in certain gaps. Um, sort of back into Africa, for example, again, there are big gaps um, in terms of what, what, what works well and what doesn't work well. A lot of these registries in, in African countries are still very much paper-based, for mm. example, so it's very archaic in that sense. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that it's, it can't be done or doesn't work, but certainly are challenges. Um, in, in, in sort of protecting one's IP mm. in, in, into Africa. McLean, I, I want us to just spend a little bit of time on the practicality of having innovation-driven economies uh, and a, a big support and appreciation for intellectual property in African markets in particular. What are some of the key things that become a hindrance or a, a backlog on the ground when it comes to actually operationalizing the protection of intellectual property? Yeah, so I think there's two aspects. There's actually the protection and then there's also the utilization of the information. And, uh, you know, my sense is, um, you know, as much as we need to actually protect and respect intellectual property, we also need to actually uh, start to create access to patent information, for example. Uh, so, you know, Johnny has referred to some of these patent offices being paper-based, being archaic. And so accessing patented information, uh, and in some cases, one actually lacks to ac actually access that information, it's, it's actually quite critical because if one can be able to access patented information, you're able to learn about uh, the latest trends, you're able to then uh, utilize the patent system effectively by then uh, you know, improving you know, on it. And so we've seen in South Africa, you know, as a, if one uses South Africa as a case in point, the Department of Science and Technology emphasizing more access, uh, more respect, uh, more protection for intellectual property uh, through establishment of structures such as NIPMO you know, and the like. But I think we need to go perhaps beyond that and look uh, in the Far East and look at what the Asian Tigers have done uh, in the past where they have actually utilized access to patent information to develop their economies. And therefore we need to start to say, what are those technologies that we need to import and perhaps how do we then amend our laws to make uh, available protection for uh, incremental uh, inventions, uh, such as uh, utilizing petty patents or utility uh, patents. On that note of picking up lessons from the Asian economies, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, let's pick up what can be extrapolated for these economies that has relevance for emerging and developing markets. We'll see you straight after the break.
Welcome back to Invest Africa. And still with me in studio is Johnny Fiendero. He's a partner at Adams and Adams. And joining us via Skype from Beijing is McLean Sibanda. He is the chief executive of the Innovation Hub. Now, before we went to break, McLean, you were highlighting some of the key insights that could be extrapolated from the Asian economies and perhaps brought into the African context. But surely, uh, we can't necessarily do this in a cookie-cutter approach. What are some of the challenges that you think we're likely to still contend with on the ground in an African context? So I think some of the challenges, uh, one, there's an issue of cost uh, in terms of uh, utilizing intellectual property and also protecting it. There's also the education system, uh, and, and uh, we need to upgrade our education system. And if one looks at the Asian Tigers, Korea being a case in point, they emphasized uh, education uh, together with intellectual property over a period of time. And then the last thing is perhaps access to markets. Mm. You know, that is quite critical as well. Let's get into the cost bit a little bit more, Johnny, because one would think that if this is a policy priority and there's an appetite for investment, why is cost still a barrier when it comes to intellectual property in the African market? Well, I don't really know. Um, certainly from a, a local context, for example, mm. if we are to protect innovation, yeah, the, the point is that uh, it's a highly skilled uh, work. I mean, with a lot of work that has to go into properly embodying and describe, uh, describing an invention, for mm. example. I um, mean, to Africa, for example, I think those skills are just quite short, to be mm. honest. And I think... Uh, um, at the moment, they, they would either typically outsource or just um, because they don't quite know how to manage it, they, they do the best they can and mm. for some reason tend to charge a premium. But just to stay on this issue, uh, if, if we take a look at, at the cost and, mm. and we, we put that aside and we take a look at education and we put that aside, mm. are there any other structural adjustments, especially if we look at the South African context, that you think if we made these structural adjustments, we could be well on our way to uh, accelerating the creation of a knowledge-based economy, accelerating the creation of an inno innovation-based economy, just for South Africa? Well, I think in the South African context, for example, on the patent side, um, we, we are not an, an examining country, for example, and mm. therefore the patents are examined substantively as to whether they are of any use or whether they're valid, in fact. They largely just get lodged and, and proceed to grant. And now there are moves afoot to, in fact, change that over the next few years. So searches and examiners are being trained up, and we will then have a, an examination system on, on, on the patent side. And that from, from, I mean, we're almost the only country in the world that doesn't do substantive examination. Mm. So I think that would, would move us quite a bit up the ranks in terms of, well, we're now on par, and now while well, a South African market for a South African patent that's been examined and, mm. and granted is significantly mm. more value. Yes, it might come at a cost, um, but it, it would, be, it would ha have a certain higher value, mm. I would say. McLean, so examination is uh, one of the levers that Johnny has identified. You made mention earlier of amendment of certain laws. Are there particular laws that we can identify that we can say this right now is a hindrance uh, to the development of a, a market that appreciates intellectual property in South Africa? And if we change this particular law, we might actually accelerate the journey a little bit more. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps if we stay with the patent sector, uh, one of the things that South Africa is a member of the WTO, and uh, in terms of the TRIPS agreement, there's certain flexibilities that uh, we can be able to incorporate into our law. Uh, and these would include certain uh, ex exceptions, like the research exception. I'd also perhaps uh, push further to say perhaps we need to introduce a utility uh, patent, uh, you know, system. And, uh, and I think the other thing is invention on its own or intellectual property on its own will not really uh, provide the value. I think we need to uh, link up uh, in, in this uh, with uh, entrepreneurship. And when one talks about entrepreneurship uh, plus the intellectual property, we then move to commercialization and then accessing to markets. And I think within the South African context, we also perhaps need to start to look at uh, you know, procurement. Uh, for example, government invests significantly in terms of innovation. How do we then get government to procure much more easily uh, from uh, people that have been supported by government? And, and so then, and therefore, then we start to make it practical in terms of how do we then move ideas from being ideas uh, through to prototypes and then eventually to something that is useful to society. 
McLean, staying with some of the African examples, when you start talking about innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, the East African part of the, of the continent comes to mind, in particular some of the work around Silicon Savannah. Where are the leaders in the market uh, on the African continent when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship? And what is it that you think is the, the magic sauce that other markets need to latch on to if we're really uh, going to scale uh, innovation and entrepreneurship on the continent? Yeah. So, I mean, Kenya is actually doing, uh, you know, very well. East Africa is doing pretty well. Uh, Kenya, uh, Tanzania, we're seeing Ethiopia as well. And Nigeria on the West is actually doing pretty well. South Africa is doing, you know, very well, but we're not actually talking a lot about what we're doing. Rwanda is doing well. Part of it is driven by also the ICT policy, the bandwidth uh, access policy in Kenya is really driven much of that uh, particular activity. And perhaps uh, from a South Africa point of view, where we need to be uh, doing more is uh, on the ICT side, the bandwidth, but we've actually got a much broader, uh, I believe, innovation in a system. We've got the right kind of uh, you know, institutions as well. And perhaps what we should be learning is uh, from initiatives such as the Innovation Prize for Africa, mm. uh, run by the African Innovation Foundation, uh, where we need to be celebrating the various successes and the various entrepreneurs that we see within the African continent. There is a lot of innovation in Africa, despite the challenges you know, that are out there. What about indigenous <coughs> knowledge systems? Do, does that an innovation fit in one sentence, especially in the African continent? Or has innovation and intellectual property uh, as a key driver uh, of innovation sort of been locked outside of ind indigenous knowledge systems on the continent? I, so I certainly think indigenous knowledge obviously has a role to play. I mean, one can't just ignore it. And there's a wealth of knowledge there. I think the question there is how does one protect it if it's protectable and how does one then commercialize it mm. now i think that there are measures in place already in some of our legislation to address that to address the commercialization of of that indigenous knowledge mm. it's a challenge in the sense of course that i mean at the, end, at the end of the day this is knowledge within a particular community for example and I think to, to, to say, well, come give us all this information and knowledge, let us record it. I think it's, it's going to be met, met with skepticism, uh, I suspect, mm. and I th um, no doubt that it would. And uh, I've no doubt that you know, those concerns um, we would, would pervade throughout, through, throughout the continent. So I think it, it certainly has a role to play mm. um, in a side-by-side -side relationship, I would say. Um, I'm not sure whether one could properly interlink the yeah. two, to be honest. Um, and uh, it's, it's a matter of, of dealing with the sensitivities about recordal and, and exploitation. Maybe let's quickly shift as we begin to wrap to creative industries and, uh, and, and in particular here around intellectual property and creative industries. McLean mentioned it at the beginning. Is this a different ball game? Is this easier with creative industries? And how are Africans in the creative industry space comparing with other artists in this particular space when it comes to really making sure that their intellectual property is protected? I mean, I think right up front, we're probably one of the most innovative crowd around the world, in, certainly into Africa as well. I mean, so there's certainly material there. And obviously, the, that sort of material and, and creative industries take on various different forms. Mm. Um, you obviously, I mean, our, our music is, is top notch, mm. our artistic work is top notch, and all, all, all those, those sort of things. And I think in South Africa, again, I mean, there are, are amendments to the Copyright Act to, to kind of more fairly um, capture that and, and, and remunerate uh, the individuals accordingly. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it, it does come down at the end of the day to, to education and, and, and knowledge of what one can and can't do. And, and the skills, as McLean was saying, or the conduits to, div to push that into the mm -hmm. market with a view to commercializing. Mm. So creative industries in, in, in South Africa and Africa seeming to really have moved ahead in terms of uh, protecting that uh, knowledge economy. McLean, let's bring you in on the small and medium-sized enterprise conversation. There's a view that exists that intellectual property uh, is somehow far removed from the world of SMEs. Is this an accurate perception? Well, it, it's not really an accurate perception. I think uh, some of the barriers have prevented SMEs from utilizing intellectual property. If one looks uh, at the incubation programs that we run within the Innovation Hub, there's a lot of uh, emphasis that we've started to place on intellectual property. The biopark, uh, we then are focusing, there's quite a number of companies there that are doing a whole lot of work 
indigenous law and then we then in indigenous uh, knowledge systems and we're linking them uh, into the mainstream you know businesses i think the you know the big challenge is obviously you know what you do not know at times you know can be very dangerous and and so therefore many smes have tended to shy away from intellectual property but even their brand is intellectual property so they should be utilizing you know that building strong brands because they are the future of the economy well, on that note, uh, SMEs are the future of the economy and they need to understand that they also have intellectual property that needs to be protected. A very big thank you to my guest, that's Johnny Fiandero, partner at Adams & Adams, and McLean Sabanda, chief executive of the Innovation Hub. Of course, if you'd like to take part in these conversations, you can certainly do that. That's by dropping us a tweet using the hashtag InvestAfrica and, of course, following us at CNBC Africa. For myself and the InvestAfrica team, it's goodbye for now.